before we get in too much trouble here. Um, happy days to all of you. Um, you know what, we're gonna start with good news today. Um, and a belated Valentine's Day note uh, that your colleague Maria Krinova gave birth on Valentine's Day to a beautiful little baby boy named Alex. Um, so I know you join me in sending all our love to, her, to Alex's parents and wish a strong and healthy life. And I hope he starts asking a lot of questions to Maria very quickly. All right. Um, in a short while, uh, which is also good news, I will be joined uh, by our colleagues from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Our guest will be our friend uh, Navid Hanif, who you know very well, the director of DESAS Financing for Sustainable Development Office. And he will be joined by Danielle Platz, a DESAS Economic Affairs Officer. They will be here to brief you on the UN Handbook on Infrastructure Asset Management. Uh, tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning, as you may know, the Security Council will hold an open meeting by video conference on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, prior to hearing a briefing from uh, UNICEF's Executive Director, Henry Tafour, Council members will hear from the Secretary General. Uh, he will make some brief remarks, which will include a proposal to increase vaccine solidarity, and we'll share those remarks ahead of time with you as soon as we get them. Um, on Libya, uh, early this, uh, rather mid-morning, the Secretary General spoke by phone with Mohamed Yunus Menfi, the President-elect of the Presidency Council of the Lab Libyan National Unity Government, and with Abdul Hamid Deba, uh, Beba, excuse me, the Libyan Prime Minister-designate. In his calls, the Secretary General stressed the UN support to Libya's elections, the monitoring of the ceasefire, and the need for withdrawal of foreign forces. He continues to stress the need for national reconciliation and for the inclusion of 30% of seats for women. Uh, I do expect a much more detailed readout uh, shortly. And this morning, the Secretary General spoke by pre-recorded video message to the G5 Sahel Summit that is being held in N'Djamena, in Chad. He said that despite recent promising developments, he remains concerned about the deteriorating security situation in the region, in particular, the Liptako Gorma, uh, in particular in Liptako Gorma, which borders Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. The spiral of violence there is aggravating an already difficult humanitarian situation. The Secretary General said that the G5 Sahel has a key role to play in addressing this crisis, and he called for sustained funding for the joint force. Um, he added that beyond the security response alone, development, the rule of law, and good governance are the cornerstone of stability in the region. He noted that his special coordinator for development in the Sahel, Marje, will ensure that the links between the challenges in humanitarian, climate, security, political, and of course, development fields are taking into account in a much more integrated and efficient approach. On Somalia, you will notice that this morning uh, we also issued a joint statement uh, from the Secretary General and the African Union Commission Chairperson, Musafaki Mahatmat. Uh, the, both leaders condemned, excuse me, both leaders commended the people and leaders of Somalia for progress achieved in recent years towards stabilization of the country. The hard-won gains are a testimony for the firm determination of the people of Somalia towards a lasting peace and prosperity following decades of instability. The chairperson and the secretary general called on Somali leaders to resume dialogue and work in a spirit of compromise to overcome the last political hurdles to inclusive elections as soon as possible and respecting the agreement they reached on September 17, 2020. Um, Ms. Uh, Musafaki and Antonio Guterres reiterated their commitment to continue to support the government and people of Somalia on their path to peace and prosperity. And the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, today announced an initial rapid allocation of $15 million from the UN Central Emergency Response Fund. This is to go to uh, the outbreaks of Ebola in both Guinea and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is the first time that Ebola has been recorded in Guinea since last outbreak that ended in 2016, as you will recall. The outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is in the same area as the 10th Ebola epidemic that claimed more than 2,200 lives from August 18th 
uh, from August 2018 to June 2020. The funding will help both countries respond to the outbreak and support neighboring countries to prepare. Detailed allocation divisions will be made in the next few days as we receive more details about the specific requirements and needs on the ground. And here, or at least virtually here, Janine hennis plaskert the Secretary General Special Representative for Iraq, brief Security Council members. She began condemning, she began by condemning last night's deadly rocket attack on Erbil. Such reckless attempts to inflame tensions pose grave threats to Iraq's stability, she said. She went on to brief about preparations for elections in Iraq, adding that for credible elections to take place, it is imperative that parties and candidate operate in a free and safe environment. The same goes to members of the media. In this regard, she warned, recent incidents are highly troubling, to say the least. For elections to be trusted, she said, unfounded theories must be disproved, baseless accusations refuted, and intimidation replaced with accountability. She also said that Iraq must build its domestic resilience to, and to be shielded from rivalries. Turning to Yemen, um, and again turning to Mark Lokok, who expressed his alarm regarding intensifying hostilities in Marib. He said the fighting is threatening to trigger a new wave of displacement and heighten an already dire level of humanitarian need. Before this escalation, there were already about one million internally displaced people in Marib. Humanitarian partners are continuing to provide assistance in the area. Over the last several weeks, this has included more than 6 million liters of safe drinking water, as well as emergency shelter kits, non-food items, and family tents. However, the 2020 Humanitarian Response Plan for Yemen has only received 56 percent of what is required. And on Myanmar, our team in the country says they're concerned with the impacts of a draft cybersecurity bill that has been circulating uh, that has been circulated to mobile network operators and licensed network service providers. Um, the team is deeply worried that the bill is not aligned to international human rights standards as it would permit illegitimate military appointed authorities to infringe on the rights to freedom of expression, access to information, privacy and security. Two quick COVID updates for you. First, the World Health Organization yesterday gave the green light for two versions of the AstraZeneca uh, Oxford vaccine to be rolled out uh, through COVAX. The vaccines are produced in the Republic of Korea and in India. WHO says the countries with no access to vaccines to date will finally be able to start vaccinating their health workers and populations at risk, contributing to COVAX's facility's goal of equ equitable vaccine distribution. Also, UNICEF today launched the Humanitarian Air Freight Initiative with 10 leading airlines supporting the prioritization of delivery of COVID-19 vaccines and other critical supplies. The new initiative will also act as a global logistics preparedness mechanism for other humanitarian health crises over the longer term. The participating airlines cover routes to more than 100 countries in support of COVAX. Uh, and they include, among others, Cathay Pacific, Etihad, Air France, and other airlines are pending confirmation. And from the Philippines, where a UN team led by resident coordinator Gustavo Gonzalez has been supporting the government in their COVID-19 readiness assessment to it, as well as vaccination plan. The UN is also supporting the Asian Development Bank's and the World Bank's efforts to define a suitable financing model for the country's vaccination plan. Our team is helping the government with national risk communication and community engagement. We have trained more than 2,000 health workers to help them address vaccination, hesitation, myths, and misconceptions. Through the COVAX facility, the UN team is committed to providing 44 million doses of vaccines to address the needs of 20% of the population this year. Government plans to vaccinate 60 million people this year and the entire population by 2023. Um, the UN mission in the Central African Republic is telling us that forces are on high alert in Bambari, in the Waka Prefecture. This follows heavy clashes that began yesterday between combatants of the UPC and the Central African troops, supported by bilateral forces. Peacekeepers have been conducting robust patrols to ensure protection of civilians. They've also evacuated civilians caught in the firefight areas. Approximately 800 people have sought refuge at the mission's, located, uh, missions location in Elevage in the Bambari district. 
In Bangasu, uh, the UN police are assisting Central African internal security investigation over the killing of six civilians by armed combatants. This took place in a village close uh, to Bangasu last Thursday. Bangasu last Thursday. Meanwhile, the mission's disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration unit organized a two-day workshop that brought together 20 community leaders. They represented local authorities, youth groups, women's groups, and members of local peace and reconciliation committee. The workshop focused on mediation, conflict management, and social cohesion, in addition to providing health safety guidelines to prevent the spread of the virus. And just to say, uh, turning to nearby Burundi, the UN Refugee Agency, along with 33 partners, are appealing for close to $223 million to provide humanitarian assistance to over 315,000 Burundian refugees who are currently located in Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, and the DRC. The agency pointed out that last year's response to the refugee situation was among the most underfunded globally. This year's appeal seeks critical support to provide food, shelter, education, as well as access to health care and water. And as you will recall, I think last week or the week before, we flagged that WFP was also at risk of cutting food rations to Burundian refugees due to lack of funding. Mr. Bayes. So a couple of follow-ups to things that you uh, read out. You read out uh, Mr. Lowcock's concern about the Marib situation. The U.S. State Department has gone further. They say that the Houthis must halt their advance on Marib. Does, um, does the Secretary General and Mr. Griffiths share that view? Yeah, I think what, what we've been saying and continues to say is that the renewed fighting in uh, Marib is a real threat to only internally displaced people, and none of this fighting also in, in any way helps uh, getting us back to a political track. So indeed, we feel the fighting should stop. But you haven't spoken specifically there about the Houthis, and it appears to be a Houthi offensive. I mean, I, I think we've we've said we've we've been uh, I think very clear in that the escalation uh, from any quarter is detrimental uh, to the ongoing mediation efforts. And a follow-up on your Myanmar statement: uh, There's a new charge facing Aung San Suu Kyi. Reaction, please. Look, uh, we have called for charges against her to be dropped, for her to be uh, to be released. Uh, and I think the adding of a new charge, just uh, our reaction is to, to continue, I think, in, in our firm denunciation of everything that has happened uh, in Myanmar, uh, the overturning of the, the will, democratic will of the people, and we need to, s and the, the ongoing uh, arrest and detention of political leaders, of activists, and people's, the inability of people to uh, protest peacefully. Finally, for now, for me, um, the daughter of the ruler of Dubai, Sheikha Latifa, mm -hmm. um, there, there was, back in 2019, you remember, a, a lot of um, mm -hmm. news about her and, and, and where, her whereabouts and, 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 whether she, uh, and how she was returned to Dubai. Um, now, new video has emerged. The BBC is broadcasting it, um, and she is claiming she is being held hostage by the royal family there. Does I mean, the UN have a reaction? My understanding from our colleagues in Geneva that this is something the UN's working group on arbitrary detention will be looking at. Edie, and then we'll go. Um, but Steph, a first a follow up on the Secretary General's conversation with the transitional mm -hmm. president and prime minister of Libya. Um, has there been uh, any signs of uh, withdrawal of uh, foreign fighters and mercenaries from Libya? And what is the status of the UN advance team? Is it there? And how long is it going to be there? And um, when is the Secretary General going to be getting a report from them? Okay, uh, I have not gotten here any uh, updates uh, on troops, uh, foreign troops uh, leaving. Uh, we want that. Uh, uh, we want that to happen, uh, obviously, as soon as uh, possible. Um, 
we are continuing to uh, work on the deployment of an advanced team uh, to Libya security conditions and obviously COVID-19 requirements permitted. Uh, and as soon as I have an update on when they will actually hit the ground, I will share that with you. And Hopefully you, sorry. it will be sooner rather. Yeah, yes, well, we all wish it to be sooner rather than um, later. I wanted to ask you about the trial opening in Rwanda tomorrow of Paul uh, Rusis Sabagina, who was the um, person praised for saving hundreds of ethnic, if not thousands of ethnic Tutsis during Rwanda's 1994 genocide, you might remember that was made into a movie, Hotel Rwanda, and he is going on trial tomorrow, uh, charged with terrorism, and his family fears for his life. I think we had, uh, I think first of all, I think everyone knows uh, the, uh, the amazing uh, acts of heroism uh, that he displayed uh, during during the genocide. I think we had expressed our concern during at his arrest, uh, which we continue to have, and we will be monitoring the trial very closely. Celia. Stefan, uh, I'd like to ask about Aurora Akensha. I don't know if I pronounce this right, uh, who declared last week that she was entering no. the race to be the next Secretary General. I heard that she has been asked to resign is it the rule? Because if I remember it well, Kofi Annan was working for the UN and did not resign. I, let me tell you something. I'm absolutely not aware that she's been asked to, to resign. Um, as for the, the Secretary General has no comment on her, on her stated uh, candidature, but I will, check, uh, I will check that as soon as possible because that is news, uh, that would be news to me. Uh, and I will leave it. What are the rules? I mean, can someone from the UN? Look, uh, the it is up to I will. It is up to the General Assembly and to the member states to decide who can be considered a candidate. The Secretary General has uh, has put himself forward. Um, if others put themselves forward. That's not his issue, in a sense, right? I mean, he is focusing on his own uh, candidacy. Liling. Thanks, Dad. Can, can I make a comment? Uh, uh, no, you, you, you can ask a question later. I'm not interested in comments by, in, in general, but I'm very interested in questions. I will come back to you, Abdel Hamid. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, James had actually beat me to my first question about Myanmar, but as a follow-up, could you give us a sense of whether there has been progress in the special envoy's request to visit Myanmar? And if not, what is being done to get that access? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, we want her to be able to go. I think the Secretary General made that very clear in his, his statement. She is continuing her contacts. Uh, regionally, uh, more globally. Uh, the Secretary General has also raised, uh, raised the issue. We feel it would be a step forward if she would be allowed to go in order to, uh, to, speak, to, uh, to speak to the authorities directly. As you know, she's already had one conversation with, I think, the, the deputy uh, military commander. Okay, uh, I'll, let me take some uh, questions from those who haven't asked uh, just yet, um, and she, in fact, uh, she spoke to the deputy commander again. Yet she spoke yesterday. Uh, that's the latest conversation she had uh, about about the uh, about the visit. Um, Abdel Hamid, if you have a question, please ask. I do, and a comment on you. Rejecting my comment, I, I just I, want to remind you. This, this is, of in, in, this, in this environment, I'm the one who comments in answer to your questions. <laughs> no. That's how the game is played. Okay. But go ahead, Abdel Hamid. My, my question is about uh, Gaza. Uh, the uh, COVID 19 is really uh, reaching high levels. Uh, and the, Gaza is now under real threat 
of this uh, pandemic. And Israel is preventing vaccine to reach to Gaza. A number of the human rights organization criticized the Israeli decision not to allow vaccines to reach Gaza. Do you have any comment on that? Look, uh, I will try to get an update on the vaccine situation in, uh, in, in Gaza. We, uh, the UN, have been working with the Palestinian authorities to, um, uh, to help them uh, access the, the COVAX uh, facility. We've continued to encourage Israel to help address uh, the priority needs of the Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian uh, territory. So I will try to get an update for you on that. Um, Majid. Yes, Stefan, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is about, uh, I know the, uh, the UN envoy to Iraq just made a remark about the attacks on Erbil, but now there are new developments, uh, so reports of Iran-backed militias that uh, conducted this attack, and there's a casualty. Uh, any remark from Secretary General? Well, I mean, the, the Secretary General obviously fully backs what his special representative has said. He, of course, uh, deplores these attacks. He condemns these these attacks. Uh, these attacks are also an attack on the, the, the stability of, uh, of Iraq, uh, and it is important that uh, all forces in Iraq uh, support uh, support the stability of their country, and that goes for all those member states who have an influence on what is going on in Iraq. Uh, Mr. Sato. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, <clears throat> my question is about uh, Security Council, uh, sorry, Security Conference uh, in Munich this Friday. Mm -hmm. Secretary Jared is uh, one of the major speakers uh, in that uh, online meeting, uh, including the uh, U.S. Uh, new uh, president. Uh, what's going to be the uh, SG's central message for them? I'm going to be honest with you. I have not read the remarks. So I will try not to improvise. I will read the remarks and share. But um, yeah, I, I don't want to freelance because I, I shouldn't have taken the day off yesterday, basically, is the message. OK. Uh, <laughs> we'll go to James and then back to Edie. Sort of a follow-up question. Um, but, but a more general one in, in that you have that Munich security yeah. uh, conference on Friday, you have the G7 on Friday, and you have a Security Council meeting taking place tomorrow morning, which you mentioned in your opening. So a very important day for mm -hmm. global, uh, mm -hmm. a few days for global diplomacy, and all of those events, I think, are going to focus on COVID-19. Mm -hmm. What is the one thing that the Secretary General wants all of those leaders who are going to be speaking at those events? What's his one big ask? The one big ask, I would say, is to truly operationalize vaccine solidarity, to really do away with vaccine nationalism. It is clear that in the path that we're following now, uh, we will not be able to vaccinate uh, everyone at a speed that needs to be uh, done. It is fully understandable that each government looks out for its own people. That is their primary responsibility. But we do believe that through uh, enhanced international cooperation, backed by financing, uh, the needs of the wealthiest nations can be met at the, uh, the governments can meet the, 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 the needs of their own people at the same time uh, show real solidarity through financing to the developing world. I mean, we're seeing all these, these, um, uh, these strains of the virus uh, growing, and they're growing because, in a sense, the, vac the vaccines are not going uh, quickly enough. It is in everyone's self-interest. Um, whether you come from a developed country or a developing countries or middle-income country, that everyone be vaccinated. Uh, and two quick follow-ups, if I can, not to things you were talking about earlier on. Um, I think everyone is a little bit unsure of the way the SG um, process is evolving, because clearly 2016, the process 
happened differently mm -hmm. to the way it's happened in the past. And this is after that the first time that there potentially is well, a, 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 an incumbent SG mm -hmm. seeking a second term under the sort of new mm -hmm. rules. Um, so just to be clear, is the SG formally nominated by Portugal for his, for his um, aim to, 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 to have a second term? The again, we're we're in uh, you know if I my reading of the charter is is clear uh, and I'm stepping on Brendan's toes here possibly uh, the at this point uh, the president of general assembly asked the secretary general what his intentions are secretary general was very transparent there was an exchange of letter. He is clearly uh, a candidate. I'm not aware of an official letter uh, from, from Portugal, and I'm not even, this is a question you'd have to ask Brendan, I'm not even 100% sure that's a, re I don't think that's an actual requirement. What is clear is that he is a candidate. He will make himself available to member states in whatever form they want to have. Uh, and he's clearly ready to defend his record uh, and lay out his vision uh, for, the, for the next term. So he is at the, um, at the he, will, he will be at the service of member states in however they want to uh, hold forum or discussions uh, on, with him as a, as a candidate. And finally, we had slated last week a press briefing with USG Lacroix, he, which disappeared. Is that it's coming being back? Re, it's reappearing. We're trying. We're very busy towards the end of the week. We're trying to shoehorn it in. Uh, I believe today's Tuesday or Wednesday. Tuesday. Uh, probably Thursday afternoon. Uh, but he is uh, he's very keen, and he'll be here. In, he's going to be here in the building. So we wanted to have him in in person, which is always nicer. Miss Letterer. Um. Steph, before all of these uh, uh, coronavirus-related events, can you get us some statistics on how much money has actually been yeah, the co co the COVAX committed updates. to COVAX yeah. and who's given what? Well, yes, ma'am. OK, uh, unless somebody has a question. Uh, yes, uh, Iftikhar. Uh, thank you, Steph. Uh, do you happen to have the name of airlines that are helping UNICEF transport COVID vaccine around the world? Uh, what I do, sorry, what I do know is that it is, um, includes Air France, Cathay Pacific, Etihad. I think there are a number of other airlines um, that are uh, in the process of signing up, but our friends at UNICEF would know, uh, would know more. Um, Navid, I will leave it over to you. I apologize. I have to go see uh, my boss, who actually doles out my salary. So I will leave you in um, in far hands, uh, capable hands for your your bid. Take care. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you so much. Uh, great. And and so uh, if if I can interject, then uh, we have uh, we're very lucky to have with us two guests from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs.